Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. On the afternoon of January 16, 1973, five-year-old Anna Waters had just returned home from kindergarten. The storm that had wreaked havoc in her San Mateo, California town had finally stopped, and she wanted to go play in the backyard. Her mother, Michael, gave her permission, and Anna pulled on her rain boots and went outside. After about 10 minutes, alarmed by the silence out back, Michael went to check on her daughter, but little Anna was gone. An investigation quickly ensued, with everyone assuming that Anna had fallen into the nearby creek. But when she wasn't found, her family and investigators began to worry that she was abducted. But by whom? Was this a stranger abduction, or was the culprit closer to home? When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Anna Waters. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is, and then they were gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. All right. So right off the bat, we want to thank you for joining us right once again, even though the timing of it is a little awkward. So we do want to address um, that this episode is being released on a day that we do not normally release episodes. So you can consider it late from last week, early for this week. But the point is, is that we are going to be out of town for the next several days, taking care of some of Ethan's family business. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to be up in Pittsburgh and we wanted to make sure we could get this out, but basically that's kind of been messing with the, uh, the schedule here a little bit. So we do apologize and uh, we hope that you'll just bear with us and, and we'll get back going as soon as we can. For those of you who don't know, I'm Kona. And I'm Ethan. And we're the husband and wife team behind this podcast. Each week, you know, as much as possible, I tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case. Ethan doesn't know anything about the case going into the episode, and he is here to provide his reactions and questions in real time, hopefully asking some of the same ones you have at home. Now, this week, we've got an older case, but it's a doozy. We're talking about a wannabe cult leader, numerology, reincarnation. Like it was, it's a 1970s California starter pack. Yeah. Everything from the seventies. Yeah. Basically. Before we get started though, I want to give a shout out to the newest folks who joined us over on Patreon. So thank you very much to Rebecca S and Eric P. We really appreciate your support. Thank you guys so much. And as a reminder, you can get these episodes ad free by subscribing to our Patreon at any level or by subscribing on Apple Podcasts. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into the story of Anna Waters. Anna Christian Waters was born on September 26, 1967, to Michael and George Waters. Michael and George met in Thessaloniki, Greece, where George had accepted a teaching post at the American Farm School after graduating from Princeton. Michael was there and was actually married with two young children at the time. Now, I don't know exactly how and when everything happened between them, but George eventually went to New York to attend Columbia Medical School, and the two married there in 1964. After they were married, they moved to San Francisco with Michael's two young sons because George was assigned there to complete his medical residency. Anna was born in 1967 and was George and Michael's only daughter. Didn't you say he had kids too? No, just her. Just her. Yeah, he was just a teacher who had just graduated college. He was like 22 or something when they met. Yes, so they met in Greece and then ended up back in New York. But she was married with kids. Gotcha. When they met. George was, by all accounts, I mean, a brilliant man. You know, again, Columbia doctor. Like, he was a teacher, obviously, for a while. Um, And interestingly, he came from... A very harrowing background. He was actually born to his parents were Christian missionaries, 
and he was born in a Japanese concentration camp in the Philippines. Jesus. Yeah. So, and apparently he spent the first three years of his life there. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, again, just kind of like a random bit of trivia for George Waters. But after that, his parents apparently, you know, went on and became very well-to-do and and he came from, you know, a very nice family. So after they moved to San Francisco, he eventually finished his residency and then became a doctor at three different facilities. So it sounds like he just had, you know, privileges at three places. However, shortly after Anna's birth, his marriage to Michael was in trouble. Around the time Anna was born, I believe it was a little bit prior to her birth, but George met an older man named George Brody. George Waters had actually been treating uh, George Brody's companion. So he had been living with this woman, I believe, for quite a while, and, um, and she was ill, I believe, with cancer. And George Waters was her physician. So that's how George Waters and George Brody met. And just because they have the same name, we'll just be referring to George Brody as Brody for the rest of this episode. Now, for whatever reason, George Waters was fascinated by George Brody. So George started bringing Brody around and he introduced him to Michael, who was very unimpressed and kind of creeped out by him, honestly. Brody began manipulating George and was said to exercise a cult of personality over him. Mm. Basically, when someone tries to manifest a cult of personality, it means that you're getting people to create an idealized and heroic image of a leader. This is usually done through flattery and praise and results in people choosing not to question this leader, who in this case was George Brody. And, you know, and I kind of mentioned he was like a wannabe cult leader. I mean, that's kind of overstating it. He... I think to an extent was that because he just really liked to manipulate people and live off of them. So apparently this guy has never worked a day in his life. He just attaches onto people and then they support him. So prior to meeting George, it was, you know, this woman who had passed away and, you know, she apparently took care of him basically. And then once she was gone, he glommed on to George and, you know, maybe it would have been more people, but it wasn't like he had any sort of like religious thing that he was trying to get out into the world or anything like that. He was more of a grifter who just was extremely talented at manipulating vulnerable people. Brody also became interested in Anna as an infant. He was convinced that she was the reincarnation of that woman with whom Brody had lived for several decades. Oh, boy. Yeah. But the fact that this woman was still alive when Anna was born apparently didn't make much of a difference in this belief. Like, apparently, uh, that woman died of cancer when Anna was like a month old. Well, I guess if you're just making shit up as you go, timeline really doesn't matter. Though. Yeah. While Michael wasn't buying into Brody's whole shtick, Brody and her husband were able to convince her to legally add the name Efe to Anna's name, and that's spelled E-I-F-F-E-E. Now, that doesn't have any meaning by itself, but apparently when you add it to Anna Christian Waters, it lines up with George Brody's name in numerology. Okay. This obsession with Anna's name lining up with Brody's is strange for, you know, obviously a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that George Brody is widely to believe to be an alias. So what would it matter? Because that's not his real name. But again, more on that later. And Michael has said basically that she agreed to this, not because she thought that it mattered or meant anything, but she was a little afraid of George Brody. And apparently he and her husband were just like so insistent on this that eventually she's like, you know what? Fine, we can change it. But, you know, knowing in her heart, she's like, this name has nothing to do with Anna or me or anything. We're never going to use it. This is all very weird. Yeah. George's obsession with Brody grew to the point where his and Michael's marriage began to fall apart. The two divorced when Anna was about a year old, and he never came back to visit his daughter after that. Yikes. Yeah. Now, a lot of the information I'm getting for this episode comes from a 2005 Web Sleuths thread in which Michael came on with a person she was working on her daughter's case with named Doug French. He went by the name Dr. Doogie online, and um, Michael went by the name Anna's mom on Web Sleuths. 
The two of them were there to basically give all of the information they had in hopes of crowdsourcing the investigation, which at the time had been going on for over 30 years. Doug French apparently knew the family somewhat when he was like, you know, 12, 13. He was friends with uh, one of Anna's brothers and he like had been over to the house for dinner, you know, a couple of times or whatever, mm-hmm. but lost touch with the family. And then as an adult rediscovered this case and then contacted Michael and then has worked tirelessly for years to help her get answers. And you said he's a, a doctor or that's just, no, that was just his he... name. I, I don't know what he does for okay. a living, but yeah. According to Michael, when their marriage fell apart and George moved out, he systematically began severing ties with all of his friends and family, not just his daughter. And this would usually happen after he would introduce them to Brody and Brody wouldn't approve of them. Mm. So you see that a lot in situations like this, you know, in cult situations or even just like, you know, abusive partner situations. It's just isolating them from family and friends. Yeah. To further control and manipulate them. Yeah. And I should um, point out because this has become a question. Apparently their relationship was not like a sexual or romantic relationship at all. It really Were they living together though. Yeah. So I'm about to get to that, but, um, but yes, they did end up living together. Um, but apparently it was more of just like a leader disciple type relationship. So to your question about whether they moved in together, not only did they move together after George left Michael, but the pair moved into a CD hotel in the Tenderloin district in San Francisco. George financially supported Brody, but Brody made all of the decisions in their lives. And, you know, there's been a lot of questions. So George made a lot of money. It sounds, I mean, he's a doctor. Yeah. And so like in 1980, his salary was, I believe I read around 75,000 a year, which, you know, at the time was a lot of money, but Mm -hmm. they chose to live in these like rundown hotels. We don't really know why and we don't really know what they were spending the money on. But, you know, Anna's mom believes that it was just the anonymity that they liked because they were both b- very paranoid and they just like wanted to live under the radar. Though he continued to work as a doctor, George was becoming increasingly unstable. He would call his family and demand money from them and complain about the amount of child support he was paying for Anna. He grew paranoid and would make unfounded accusations against family and friends. Within a few years of his divorce, George was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. His family was concerned for his safety, but opted not to have him committed as that would cause him to lose his medical license. And when I mention his family, I'm talking about his parents were still alive. They were living in New York, though, and he did have siblings, and I'm not exactly sure where they lived, but he was at times, you know, isolated from them, like disconnected, but then would still be in contact, like demanding money and things like that. Gotcha. But not from Michael. Right, right. No, she said that she never really talked to him at all after their divorce. Um, You know, they would kind of communicate through lawyers for things. But yeah, he like never called to ask about Anna, you know, even prior to her disappearance, just in general. And, Um, And Brody, even though he had been obsessed with Anna, hadn't made any or attempted to make any contact. No, not at all. Okay. As her ex-husband deteriorated, Michael tried to move on with her life. She met a man named Joe Ford and the pair married. Joe quickly became the father that Anna didn't have and considered her to be his daughter. January 16th, 1973 was a Tuesday. Anna's stepfather Joe was in the construction industry, but the area where the family now lived near Half Moon Bay in San Mateo County, California, had been hit by an intense storm, so he came her home early that day. By the time Anna arrived home on the bus around 1 p.m., however, it had stopped raining. The kindergartner came home, changed out of her school clothes, and put on jeans and a t-shirt. She asked her mother if she could go out and play in the backyard, which was fenced in. Her mother agreed, so Anna pulled on a pair of oversized black rubber boots and headed out. Around 2.20 p.m., and the timeline of this has always been very basic. I was able to get more of a broken down timeline. And it sounds like in the hour or so that Anna was outside playing, she was kind of coming in and out, basically. So they had um, what they called a sleeping porch on the the house. 
So Michael said that she like heard Anna out there at one point, like talking to the cats. And then Anna came in at another point and went back out. So it wasn't like she left at one and nobody heard from her or saw her for over an hour. Gotcha. You said the yard was fenced in. Yes. Is there a gate? Yes. And okay. the gate was often left open. Okay. And it sounds like even if it wasn't left open, Anna could get out on her own. So around 2.20 p.m., it, according to Michael, it had been about 10 minutes since she had like heard Anna outside. So she just, you know, looked out back to see what she was doing and didn't see her daughter. So, you know, she looked around out front, like, you know, just around and didn't see her. So in a panic, she and her husband went outside and, you know, continued to look, but there was no sign of Anna. Michael quickly called the sheriff's department and they responded within a half an hour, arriving around 3.15 p.m. At that point, Michael's biggest fear was that Anna had wandered down to the nearby creek and fallen in. Because of the severe storms, the water was high and running fast, and she was terrified that her five-year-old daughter had stumbled and gotten swept away. When sheriff's deputies arrived, they sounded a siren in hopes of getting Anna's attention. Okay. Like from the car? I don't know. They they just said they, it was a siren. So I picture like, um, you know, those big sirens that we used to like have here in town for the like volunteer. Like an air raid siren? Kind of. But for us, it was like for the volunteer fire department, like before cell phones and stuff, like they would sound a siren if they needed assistance. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Or if it was just police cars, but there was a siren and When that didn't work, they began to call on reinforcements. The area was searched on foot, and they eventually brought in helicopters, riders on horseback, and divers for the creek. Police, of course, also questioned the neighbors to see if anyone had seen anything out of the ordinary prior to Anna's disappearance, and a few of them had. Unfortunately, it would be a few days before this information started to come out, because up to that point, they were looking at this as a case of a little girl who had wandered off. It was only after intense searches uncovered absolutely no trace of Anna that police began to consider abduction as an option. So just so that I have a clear understanding of of how the house is set up, Mm -hmm. fenced in backyard, gate on the back, does that open to like a wooded area, a field? Is there a street? nearby there is a street nearby but in the front of the house so right. I, from what i can understand and this might not be 100 percent accurate but from what it sounds like is the gate opens up i think there is kind of a field but there are woods very close by which is um, where the creek is i'm assuming yes and that's where the creek is so all of that's nearby but it doesn't open like directly into woods you know yeah but yeah the woods are easily accessible it's a rural area the house is actually described more as a ranch that they lived on Okay. And a lot of people, you know, rode horses around. It was like that type of place. Gotcha. But it was a rural road that they lived on. And so while they did have neighbors, it wasn't a road that you would be on unless you were going to those houses, you know? Yeah, it's not like a thoroughfare. Exactly. Yeah. So they basically, and, you know, we'll kind of get to, to this in a second, but like, if there were cars that you didn't recognize on the road, like you would notice it. Got it. It was that type of place. So neighbors would see if somebody was sitting in their car. Oh, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. It would definitely stand out. Yes. Okay. Now, one neighbor said that shortly before the sheriff sounded the siren, she heard rustling in the bushes near the creek. And at the time, she didn't pay much attention, again, because people would be out there hiking or on their horses or whatever. Or it could have been an animal. Exactly. Yeah. She thought it might be a deer. At the time of Anna's disappearance, Michael's female neighbor was visiting their house. Her boyfriend arrived and said that he had passed a white panel van on the road near Anna's home, driving away from the direction of her home. The van had a young man and an old man in it and seemed out of place to the boyfriend. But again, he didn't think too much of it at the time. 
But he said that it was weird. They, he said that the people were like overly friendly, even though they were complete strangers. Like they smiled and like waved out the window to him, which he just thought was a little weird. But this isn't anything that he like mentioned at the time. You know, he didn't get to the house and go like, oh, my God, I saw these two weirdos in yeah, the van. Yeah. yeah. It was later, I'm assuming, when police were right, when questioning. Yeah, absolutely. But crucially, he said that as he was approaching the house, he saw Anna in the front of the house, outside, not in the backyard. And this is after the van had already gone? After the van, yes. Okay. And he's sure about that timeline? Yes, because he said that as he was driving to the house, like he saw the van, and then when he got to the house, he saw, he saw Anna. Anna out front. Out front, yeah. And he said hi to her and went in. But that puts her away from the creek on the street. Right. Well, not on the street, in their front yard, but yes. Yeah, sure. But closer to the street than the creek. Correct. Yeah. And this apparently was just a few minutes before Michael realized that Anna was missing. This part has been reported extensively, but Michael talks about it on Web Sleuths. She believes that Anna may have been going out front to check the mail because she had seen another neighbor with their mail. Now, the mail, that day's mail hadn't come yet, and the neighbor who Anna had seen was was looking at the previous day's mail. But apparently, like, going and checking the mail was something that Anna had done a couple times before. So she thinks that that's why Anna would have been out front. Now, police extensively interviewed both the neighbor and the boyfriend who saw her because, you know, at this point, he was, like, the last person to see her. Right. But police don't believe that they had any involvement. And Michael has said that she's talked to him many, many times. He kept in touch over the years because he felt terrible because he realized he was like the last the person, last person to, to see her. her. Yeah. And, you know, he helped with the searches. He still lives in the area. Like, you know, there's nothing sketchy about this guy at all. The police eventually classified Anna's disappearance as a possible stranger abduction, though it didn't really follow the pattern of most stranger abductions. Anna wasn't near school or playground or another public place where these people tend to look for victims. Her road wasn't heavily traveled, which is why those two men in the panel van stuck out. If this was a random abduction, why would an abductor choose that place at that time? Right. Middle of the day on, people, a, on a street where people would recognize people or see a person in a car as being out of the ordinary, yeah. strange car. And people were clearly going in and out. Like, people were around because, you know, she had her neighbors visiting. Like, the other neighbor was out checking their mail. And I think had actually gone to visit with Michael earlier in the day. People were around, you know? Given that scenario, aside from the panel van, did any of the other neighbors see any other vehicles that were out of the ordinary? Not that I've seen. That's really the only one. So after her daughter's disappearance, Michael says that she walked the school bus route and saw that there were several places where her home could have been watched by someone without them being seen. She theorizes that someone could have perhaps identified Anna at some point, like at school or in another public place, and then followed the school bus home to find out where she lived. So if it was a random stranger abduction, she doesn't believe that it was a crime of opportunity. Like they just happened to be passing by and saw her daughter outside. Right. She believes that it had to have been a little bit more planned than that, which I think makes sense. Given the makeup of the neighborhood, I mean, that does make sense that somebody would be watching her. I don't know. See, It seems a little extreme stalkerish to necessarily like pick her up as a mark from school follow her home and then surveil her from these different vantage points. It's it, yeah. it almost seems like that's a little excessive. What's the timeline here? How, how long has it been since Brody had been in the picture? He had been in the picture for Anna's entire life. Right. But I mean, um, the divorce when George cut contact, they divorced when Anna was about a year old. Okay, so, so four years prior to four this. years with yeah. no contact. Yeah. With George or Brody. Yeah, like Anna did not know George. She did not know Brody. You know, she considered Joe to be her father. You know, obviously, like, that dude, Brody, is prime suspect, given yeah. what you've told me. So I'm wondering what they were doing at the time. 
Right. And eventually other people began to wonder that too. But again, not initially. Yeah. Because initially, I don't think anybody was even thinking about them because they yeah. haven't seen them in four years. Right. Yeah. And they thought that she wandered into the creek, you know? Right. Michael and Anna's stepfather, Joe, were seemingly ruled out fairly quickly, but police suspicion, again, did eventually fall to her absent father and his weird numerology obsessed wannabe cult leader friend. It's a, it's a very long title. Yeah, well, Michael's belief in her ex-husband's involvement has changed over the years, but at this time, it seems as though that she and Joe highly suspected him. I mean, again, after everything else that made more sense was ruled out. Yeah. Police went into the city to question the pair, but they, of course, denied having any involvement in Anna's disappearance. And I've actually read a few conflicting things about this. I've read that, you know, police did question them both, but then... I've read that police only questioned George and not Brody. So I'm not 100%. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't make any sense. I have to believe that at some point over the years, they would have been able to question Brody, despite how like secretive and weird they are. Yeah. Um, and if they were still living in seedy motels and like that, it's not like they'd be able to hide Anna somewhere. George didn't seem to be terribly affected by his daughter's disappearance. He never reached out to Michael about it or offered to assist in any way. The only thing she ever heard from him was through an attorney when he asked if he could stop paying child support. Oh, dick. Yeah. Oh my God, what a dick. And apparently he did that like right after because so she went missing on January 16th. So he had already paid January's child support payment. He reached out to ask if he had to pay February's. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, okay, yeah, you can see that as suspicious because it's like, oh, he knows she's not coming back. But I think this guy was really just a dick. So I can also just see it from that perspective as well of him right. just not could, wanting to pay. And that also could have been something that... um Brody dropped in his ear, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the issue of child support had always been contentious, even though he paid very little in uh -huh. child support. Like, it was just always a problem for him. Now, I don't know how intensely the police actually went after George, but Joe, on his stepfather, wouldn't let it go. He followed George and Brody for years doing his own surveillance. The pair acted paranoid and seemingly figured out that they were being watched and often used evasive tactics while they were out. At times, they would use fake names at hotels or have multiple rooms registered at once. And again, it's hard to ascribe motive to this, right? Like, did they actually have something to hide or... Well, I mean, he was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. Exactly. So Is this just... Who yeah. they are. Yeah. Right. A few years after Anna went missing, Joe mailed George a letter accusing him of having something to do with Anna's disappearance. He then rented the room next door and listened through the wall so he could hear George's reaction. This is very like no country for old men. <laughs> yeah, Joe, I'm telling you, he was uh, into it. Um, now, according to Joe, he heard George say, quote, I'm glad the tot is dead, end quote. Jesus. Now, yeah, this doesn't prove anything, but George was known to have referred to his daughter as the tot in the past. According to Doug French, the man who was helping Michael out with the investigation in the early 2000s, George also began taking out multiple insurance policies on himself around the time of the disappearance. Brody was the beneficiary on some, while others named Anna. That's interesting. Yeah. That'd be a waste of money if, if they knew she was dead. Exactly. The policies naming Brody the beneficiary allegedly totaled over $1 million. Over the years, investigators, both official and amateur, continued to look at the various possibilities surrounding Anna's disappearance. According to Michael, the creek was searched extensively, and though that was her first thought, neither police nor Anna's family believed that Anna got swept away. According to Michael on Web Sleuths, quote, Despite searches over a year's time of the creek, there was not a single indication that she had gone there. Divers picked out the many log jams one by one over a two-mile stretch, and a geologist later said it was impossible, considering tides, currents, and silting patterns, that we should not have recovered evidence if Anna had gone into the water, end quote. It should also be noted that during the initial search of the creek, they found a dead rooster that had been thrown in there earlier that day, 
as well as a cow who had ended up in the creek somehow, but had gotten stuck in one of the log jams. Yeah, so evidence that if she had been swept away, her body would have been stopped and found by one of these collections. Exactly. And don't forget, too, that she was wearing oversized black rubber boots. Right. Like, those would not have stayed on her feet. Like, those right. would have come off. They would have been found somewhere. Yeah. Plus, we have the neighbor who, or the neighbor's boyfriend, who yeah. saw her in the front yard. Yeah, like, right before they realized that she had disappeared. And, you know, granted, physically, I think there would have been enough time for sure. her to, like, get to the creek. But, again, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, none of it makes any sense. Years passed, and George and Brody continued their strange relationship. Eventually, George Brody developed cancer, and Waters treated him. He ultimately passed away on Christmas Eve, 1981. His death certificate showed no birth date or social security number, and he had no known relatives. Mm -hmm. After Brody's death, George went about destroying most of his personal paperwork, including anything associated with Brody or Anna. Two weeks later, he was found dead in his hotel room. He had taken his own life by drinking cyanide. Cyanide. Yeah, this is really kind of an aside, but uh, apparently he had become obsessed with this because like, that was how a lot of nazis ended up mm -hmm. killing themselves after yeah. the war and he apparently like wrote a letter to one of the widows of like a nazi soldier asking her about the i don't know it was it was bizarre but yes he drank cyanide you would think being a doctor he could come up with like less painful ways to go yeah but no that he just had this weird obsession about that George's brother was listed as next of kin, and he got most of his belongings. Michael did, however, end up with a box of paperwork from the hotel room that, you know, hadn't been destroyed that she has dubbed the box from hell. She has spent years digging through the bills, photographs, and other detritus in hopes of finding clues to her daughter's disappearance. And that's how we know about this, like, letter and his, like, weird thing with cyanide, because that mm, was apparently was in, there. in there. Yeah. Michael has said many times that she truly doesn't have a gut feeling about what happened to her daughter that day, but she does express doubt now that her ex-husband had anything to do with her abduction simply because she believes he was too mentally ill to pull off something like this. Well, yeah, mentally ill to pull anything off like that, but also no evidence, like, where did she go? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There has been absolutely no evidence of anything. Right. The only, you know, quote unquote, like evidence that we have is that many people believe it was impossible that she drowned in the creek. Right. Like that's kind of the only thing that can really be ruled out. So one theory, however, is that while George and Brody would not have been able to abduct and hide Anna, you know, which you mentioned earlier, perhaps they worked with parties unknown and they are the ones who physically took her. This, of course, you know, is just a theory along with like, a million other theories sure. that people have had about this case. But a revelation made by one of Anna's brothers decades after her disappearance does lend some weight to it. In that long web sleuths forum I mentioned earlier, which is just one of many dedicated to different aspects of Anna's disappearance, Michael mentions an incident that her son had only recently told her family about. And I believe she made this post in like early 2006. And she said that, she had just heard it for the first time over Christmas, like when they were all together. Her son eventually came to the forum himself and wrote out what he remembered. What he's about to describe took place approximately a month before Anna went missing. Quote, it seems like the middle of the day. Maybe it was a Saturday or Sunday. We used to like to walk toward the end of the canyon down the road heading east. The house where we lived was about 1.5 miles from the end of the canyon. We were approximately a quarter mile from our house when a car passed us and pulled in front of us about 25 feet. Saturn the dog barked at the car as a woman wearing a loose-fitting white shirt with embroidery on it and long dark hair opened up the back door. She spoke to us from within the car, a four-door American sedan that was dark green or gold. Somehow I remember it was a Chevy Impala late 60s. It was not new. I know cars pretty well. I thought it had the old-style Washington plate, white with green letters. I can't be sure about that. 
When we got the dog settled down, she made small talk and addressed Anna primarily, I believe. I answered for her, but she continued to address Anna with small talk and questions. Do you live here? Where do you go to school? Do you walk down the road often? At that point, she asked if she wanted her, us, I can't remember, to ride to the end of the road with her. This creeped me out sufficiently to turn our party around and head back home. The woman closed the door and the car scooted off quickly toward the end of the canyon. I don't remember if and how I relayed this story at the time to my parents, end quote. No idea about the other occupants in the car? No. Because she opened the back door, he said. Yeah, so yeah, it sounds like she was sitting in the back. Right, so there might have been two people, obviously a driver, but could have been one more one yeah. more in the passenger seat. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, according to Michael, she had never heard this story before. And, you know, maybe it is a coincidence, but the fact that Anna disappeared shortly thereafter makes it pretty difficult to believe that the two events are unrelated. Yeah, but then it comes back to the same thing. This is middle of the day. People are out in the neighborhood. An unfamiliar car, unfamiliar people. I mean, how likely is it that that would have gone unnoticed? But it does fit in with something else that Michael has said. Quote, Her father had joint custody, though he never had used it for a visit. Both of them, meaning Brody and George, had an elaborate and paranoid, to my mind, idea that she should be removed from our family. And this was expressed a number of times. End quote. What does that mean, removed from the family? I don't know. That even though George wanted joint custody, never used it. He and Brody both like, yeah, just had this weird belief that Anna should not be with Michael and their family. Mm. But I don't know why or, or, or anything else. But she said that, yeah, he had expressed that numerous times. And I find it so fascinating that despite making no effort to see his daughter, that she was still obviously on both of their minds. George and Brody clearly didn't believe that this child fit into whatever their weird lifestyle was. But maybe their delusional beliefs included feeling that she should go to someone else. Mm. The absolute lack of clues and evidence in this case have obviously haunted Anna's family for decades. Joe seemingly became obsessed with finding answers and also joined the Websleuths Forum, despite the fact that he and Michael divorced many years prior. Whether George and Brody were involved in Anna being taken or not... Michael does believe that Anna could be alive out there somewhere, and they have investigated many women with sketchy pasts who believed that they could be Anna. On the flip side, they've also investigated several Jane Doe's that could also have potentially been her. Michael and at least one of her sons has also submitted their DNA to various ancestry sites in hopes that an adult Anna or even Anna's children are out there and may submit their own DNA sample. While there have been no hits so far, when we record this in 2024, those who love Anna have not given up hope. You know, this is one of those cases that like truly anything could have happened. And so Anna very well could have been out there somewhere all this time leading what she thought to be a perfectly normal life. Right. Because, you know, she was only five when she went missing and you lose a lot of memories prior to that age. And so she could have been abducted and then eventually just believed in whatever new identity she had. Right. And I think it is unlikely that it was just a random stranger abduction, but it's hard also to ascribe blame to George and or Brody because yes, they were completely, you know, nuts. Yeah. Not to be insensitive to people with mental health issues, people have mental illnesses all the time. That doesn't mean that they're going to abduct and hide a child, you know? Right. So that could just all be a coincidence, right? Like, yes, she went missing and she also had a father who lived a bizarre lifestyle in San Francisco with a creepy cult-like man, you know? It's just, it's it's hard to say, which is why this case has been unsolved for so long. Yeah. Michael has also worked tirelessly to keep Anna's story alive. In addition to her extensive posting over the course of years on web sleuths and other forums, she also wrote a book called Searching for Anna, in which she talks about her daughter and details the circumstances of her case. 
It's available on Amazon, and you can find the link in our show notes. Joe Ford on his stepfather passed away several years ago. But in a post on Web Sleuths, he spoke about how talking about Anna and having other people involved in the investigation was cathartic to him. Quote, the circumstance of Anna's fate, be it by the hand of God or mortal, is the single most inexplicable event that has happened to me in my lifetime, and the most devastating. It is a heart-wrenching mystery. I've begun to notice a lightning of spirit lately, however, that is the result of sharing this tragedy with you all as if by spreading it around among us makes it easier to bear individually. For this, and the renewed hope of seeing Anna's face again in this lifetime, I am deeply grateful. End quote. Michael has also talked about how people's interest in her daughter's case makes Anna feel more alive to her. Anna Waters may have gone missing over 50 years ago, but hope lasts forever. Anna Christian Waters has been missing from Half Moon Bay, California, since January 16, 1973. She's a white female with blonde hair and brown eyes. Anna has a mole on her cheek and dimples on her face. She was last seen wearing a blue and white striped t-shirt, blue jeans, and black oversized rubber boots. She was five when she went missing. She would be 56 today. Anyone with information regarding Anna Waters' disappearance is asked to contact the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office Missing Persons Unit at 1-650-364-1811. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and TikTok. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we will see you back here as soon as we possibly can with a brand new episode. See you then. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster Production.